Hi everybody and welcome back to Lost Genre Reddit Stories. This post is from the subreddit Relationships and it's by user Deleted. My 28 male grandma, 96 female, deceased, changed her will before she died, leaving me around 50% of her assets when I was originally to get 2%. One of my uncles, 66 male, is mad about this. Also, there's a model train layout involved. Before I begin, I've already got the legal end of things figured out. I know you would all just point me to r slash legal advice if I didn't say this. The issue is not about who gets what so much as it is about fixing bad blood between my extended family and me. So, when my grandfather passed away about 14 years ago, my grandmother had her sons. My dad, his two brothers, we'll call UL and UR, and the three grandchildren who had kids, three of UL's kids to talk about her will and financial stuff. The three grandchildren who did not have kids, myself, my brother and UL's youngest child, were not there. My grandma had a lawyer there and she laid out in her will that she wanted all her financial assets liquidated upon her death and for around half of the money to be divided amongst any grandchildren or great-grandchildren who had either not been to college yet, were in college or had outstanding student loans and the rest of the money to be divided equally amongst her sons, grandchildren and great-grandchildren. I didn't know or care about the specifics of the meeting. I was 14 when grandpa died and it was just sort of the adults off in another room talking about adult stuff. Fast forward 12 years. I've finished college and grad school and got a job in my grandma's and UR's city. My immediate family lives a few hours away and I went to college a few hours away in another direction. Grandma's health was deteriorating and she had to move into an assisted living facility. When she heard that I was going to be moving to her city, she told me that I could live in her now vacant house rent free. I tried to pay rent and she refused. I was hugely grateful and not having a lot of friends in that city, I spent most of the time that I wasn't at work or on maneuvers with my reserve unit at the nursing home hanging out with her. We played cards, ate, shot the crap and I put together a small video collection of her telling what it was like growing up during the depression, losing her brother in World War II, meeting my grandpa, the civil rights movement, the rise of the desktop computer, the whole deal. She died suddenly. I mean, she had a lot of health problems but nobody really had time to say goodbye. About six months ago. Unbeknownst to me or most of the family, a few months before she died, my grandma changed her will so that I would get her house, which made up about 50% of her net worth by the time she died, and the rest of her assets would be liquidated and divided up like discussed 14 years ago. This surprised us all, but nobody really said anything for a while. A few weeks later, UR, he and his wife are the only other members of the family who live in the city, was helping me go through the house and send stuff, sentimental pieces, not anything of huge monetary value, to our relatives that had requested them. E.g. one of the cousins wanted the kangaroo hide from when grandpa was stationed in Australia. There weren't any conflicts over this stuff, but throughout the day you are kept making bad-handed comments at me like, oh, you better not keep my dad's Air Corp stuff since you aren't a real veteran. I'm a reservist who's never been deployed, you are was in Vietnam. I didn't want my grandpa's military stuff and didn't give any indication that I did, so it just seems like you are was being a dick for no reason. He strongly hinted that he was pissed off about me getting the house, which to be fair was his childhood home. I just tried to smile and tell him that of course he's welcome whenever he has a key. Anyway, the tipping point was over grandpa's model railroad layout, which is quite big. While I had been living here the past two years, I've taken a few hours here and there to restore it. It's in pretty bad shape. My grandma stopped going into the basement after grandpa died and it's been collecting dust and generally falling into the spare the past decade and a half. You are thinks that I shouldn't have messed with it. Grandpa wouldn't have wanted that. I don't think grandpa would want it to just fall apart and I got the idea from my dad after all. On the one hand, I get that you are, UL and my dad grew up playing with that set and helped build it with their dad, my grandpa. And so he thinks that he should decide what happens with it. 
On the other hand, I grew up playing with it too and just wanted to get back into shape so that my cousin's kids and maybe my and my brother's kids someday will get to use it too. He finally admitted that he wasn't against the set being restored, he just wanted to do it himself, and that it was crappy of me to not tell him that I was working on it for the past two years. I responded by telling him that he's had 14 years since Grandpa died to start working on it if he had wanted to, and I didn't tell him because even though we live in the same city, I don't see him that much and I haven't been devoting enough time, I spend maybe one or two hours a week, which I guess adds up, to it for it to cross my mind to mention to him. He tells me that I'm a greedy crap who probably manipulated grandma into leaving me the house. I didn't. She and I never really talked finances beyond her saying, wow, it's expensive being old when opening her mail. And that he ought to beat me up. I told him that I'd like to see him try. I admit that I should have been trying to de-escalate. He stormed off. A week after that, my cousin's husband, CILC, calls me saying that UR had come to visit UL and that whole family in the next state over. UR had apparently talked crap about me all weekend, etc. CILC said that while he had been surprised at the Will situation, UR was being a jackass about it and he thought it was cool that I was working on the train layout. CILC married in while grandpa was sick. I don't think he or his kids have ever seen the trains in action. I said thanks and we talked about other stuff. It occurred to me though that UR might be trying to get other people in the family against me, but it also seems crazy to me that he would do that. The weirdest thing about it is UR has no kids, never mind kids going to college. He and his brothers, my dad and UL, lost the least out of the will change. I don't get why he is so salty about it. He has a white collar job and is about to retire with savings and a pension. I tried to call him to patch things up, the train situation, the money, the whole deal, but he won't return my calls. The worst thing about it is that growing up, he was always my favorite uncle on both sides of my family. I Skyped my parents last night and I cried in front of them for the first time since I got dumped when I was like 16. I don't want this to turn into a whole thing that breaks up the family. I don't know if UL or my other cousins resent this. I don't want my cousins once removed to grow up and learn that their college savings are smaller because of me. At this point, I'd be fine refinancing the house to give everyone what was originally intended for them. That would leave me in a similar financial situation as many of the young professionals my age, and I care about keeping the family together more than money. I just wish my uncle would tell me what's really bothering him. I think it might have something to do with me hanging out with grandma almost once a day, whereas he only saw her maybe once every week or every other week. And we could hammer it out instead of him flipping out over the train set, which he's clearly just using as an excuse to be mad at me. Well, OP, I think you've said everything in your post. From everything you tell us and your own conclusions, I don't think he's upset about the will change. He's got no reason to unless he's just really, really greedy, which it doesn't sound like it because his part of the will didn't change. And it also doesn't sound like your extended family is pissed at you or anything because your grandma changed the will. So I'm inclined to think that he's mad not at you, but at what you represent, which is him not being a good son or the way he sees it as not being a good son for not visiting his mother as much in her late days. While you, on the other hand, hung out with her almost daily. If I was in your shoes, I'd give your uncle a little bit more time and space for him to come to terms with himself and with the reality of everything that's been going on. Maybe reach out to his wife so she can tell you when he would be in a proper mood for you to go over, visit and talk to him. And what do you guys think? What would you do if you were in OP's shoes? Let me know in the comment section and now let's move on to the community comments to see what they said. Massimom says, your uncle is being an a-hole. If you cave on anything, he will be a bigger a-hole because he has learned he gets his way by being one. You are right, he had 14 years to take an interest in your grandma or the train set. Presumably, your grandma was of sound mind and had her reasons for changing her will and gave it much thought. She had to make an appointment with her attorney, have at least two meetings with him and pay money for the changes. Your uncle should respect her wishes. Don't wrestle with a pig, your uncle. You'll just get dirty and the pig will enjoy it. In other words, don't engage. If family members ask you what's going on, give them the facts. 
GSG1901 says, one, model train layout is clickbait. Two, don't refinance the house, it's yours, and you get to do what you want with it, and I don't think the money is the issue. Three, you just lost your grandmother, but your uncle just lost his mother. He's not being rational, he is grieving. I know you are too, but people are not rational while they are grieving, and they both react in different ways, and sometimes tend to lash out. Don't contact him unless he contacts you for a while. Calling him is just reminding him what he lost. He didn't care about the train set for a long time. He cares about it now because it is a tangible reminder of what he used to have with his parents who are now both gone. That hurts. You can't resolve this now. You can keep living your life and hope that eventually your uncle comes to terms with his parents' deaths. Amber Rabbit says, Don't refinance the house. Don't put yourself into a bad situation just because your uncle is upset. He is likely feeling guilt because he lives in the same city and didn't come to see your grandma. I would tell your uncle the following. I would like you to have the train set, but I'm not sure how to get it out of the basement. I don't want to destroy it. So if it's too big to move and you don't have room for it, I would love you to help me continue to add and restore it. It means a lot to me and I don't want this to come between us. So one Saturday a month, would you come help me for a few hours? Opie's edit. My uncle is a lot like Walter Sobchak from The Big Lebowski, both in the good ways and the bad ways. So I guess the uncle is not wrong, he's just an a-hole? Anyways, I think OP got some pretty solid advice from the community and he has given us an update. A very short one, but he lets us know everything that is important. So let's finish this story with that. So, thanks to everyone for the advice in the original thread. I haven't called my uncle since. I've decided that I'll let him cool down and reach out to me. Anyway, last night I realized that I still had a piece of the tent that I had lent one of my co-workers kids. I brought it to the VFW, Veterans of Foreign Wars, where his Boy Scout troop is chartered, and caught them just before they left and gave him the tent piece. Unbeknownst to me, my uncle was hanging out inside, eating or drinking or whatever. I was just glancing around. I couldn't see inside the building, but he could see out, I guess. He came out and we talked awkwardly for a bit. I didn't really want to tell him off in front of a bunch of Boy Scouts, but I could tell things were not okay between us. Things slowly got a bit more heated and while we weren't yelling, some 11 or 12 year old Boy Scouts started chanting, fight, 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 at us. We both giggled at the silliness of it. He admitted that he had been a jerk to me and was just pissed off at himself for not being better with his mom. I tried to play it off that she just wanted to help me get started financially. He invited me into the VFW for a beer and I hung out with him and a Korean war vet who insisted I call him Bloodhound. We're on to hang out and do some work on the railroad tonight, so that's good. Thanks for everything, Reddit. And that's it, that's everything that OP gave us. There are no other comment answers with information or anything like that. And here I am thinking, Bloodhound sounds like a really cool dude, I'd like to talk to him, but we don't know anything else about him. Anyways, OP, this is a good update. Absolutely serendipitous, but you were able to talk to your uncle and set things straight, so good for you. Thanks so much for sharing and all the best in the future. Take care. Now, let's move on to the next post. This post is from the subreddit Malicious Compliance and it's by user Chief Stewart. Discipline me for being 22 seconds late without notice? Got it, won't happen again. This happened several years ago because it was some malicious compliance that lasted for years. My former employer uses a points-based system to track attendance. The parts of the policy that are relevant to this story are Tardy with call in prior to the start of the shift, have a point. Tardy with no call, one point. Accumulate enough points and you're fired. There's a set of train tracks crossing the street that leads to this facility. Occasionally, trains will stop while blocking this crossing. If you're caught there in the last few minutes before you're supposed to clock in, you have a decision to make. Wait or go around. Either way, you might be late. 
Sometimes you'll decide to go around and then the train clears the crossing and the folks who waited get in before you. Sometimes you'll wait and watch through the gaps in the train cars as folks who went around pull into the parking lot while you're still idling at a blocked train crossing. To be clear, going around involves taking a lot of secondary country roads as well as a few field access roads. It's an extremely rural area, so you literally never know what kind of road conditions you're going to find along the way around. One night during my years on the third shift, I was stopped at these tracks and decided to wait. Eventually, the train moved on. I raced into the parking lot, used my keycard to sift through the turnstiles and run to the punch clock. My clock in time was 10.30 p.m. They have these biometric punch clocks that read your fingerprint to clock employees in and out. Sometimes these clocks just will not read your fingerprint. I got to the punch clock and it said 10.30. I'm golden. It doesn't track seconds. I entered my employee ID number and placed my finger on the sensor. Three beeps, failed read, tried again, three beeps, tried once more, three beeps, no, not trying again because by this time the clock was likely to take over 1031 in the middle of reading my finger. When I got to my assigned work area, I told my team manager what happened. He said don't worry about it, he'd manually punch me in. I should have listened, but I'm a worrier. In the morning, when the front office people started showing back up, I went to the attendance office to confirm that my situation was all good. The office administrator decided to check my gate time and use that as the determining factor. I scanned my key card at 10.30, 22pm. That's a tardy, no call. One full attendance point is to be issued. I reiterated that it was a train stopped on the tracks completely beyond my control. She advised me to either leave earlier and just wait for half an hour for my shift to start on the majority of days or else get a cell phone. I didn't have one at all back then to call in from the road next time. Well, what I did instead was to start calling in absent just in case something comes up after I leave home but before I arrive at work in the evenings before leaving for work. The first few days the attendance office up front was just bemused. After weeks, they became annoyed. After months, they'd apparently complained enough that I finally got told to stop. During the course of this conversation, they revealed that calling in too early before the start of your shift made it extra challenging to make sure the notice gets to the right members of management because the message is no longer flagged as new by the time they're creating logs for the next shift. This was great news for me. From then on, every morning before leaving the premises at the end of my shift, I used one of their phones to call in my absence for my next shift that evening. They tried to write me up for insubordination, but the labor union slapped it down, pointing out that the collective bargaining agreement specifies the time we must call in by, but does not specify a time before which call-ins may not be made. Cue the huge grin across my face. I never forgot that my team manager tried to do me a solid though. If I was actually going to be late or absent for some reason, I would call that team management's desk line directly to let them know. Even long after I finally got a cell phone, I continued doing this. I'd just call in on my way home instead of sticking around to use their phones after my shift. Found out years and years later from some union reps that upper management never got over this drove them nuts that they got beat at their own game by something so simple. It didn't bring the walls crumbling down, but it was a persistent, enduring source of frustration and impotence for them. And really, knowing you can manage all that with just a 22 second phone call a day, that's the kind of thing that gets you out of bed in the evening. Ah, beautiful OP, just like you said, they got beat at their own game. Thank you for sharing OP, take care. And it's that time that we've reached the end of the video. I hope you enjoyed today's stories. I really did enjoy reading them to you. So if you did, then don't be shy and go ahead and give the video a like. And don't forget to subscribe or even share this video with people that you might think will enjoy my storytelling. Also, if you have the time, go down to the video description and check out all the links I have for you. From our Discord community to my channel merch. And finally, I'd like to say thank you for watching. It really means a lot to me that you enjoy my videos. And having said all that, I'll see you guys in the next video.